Hello everybody and thank you for joining tonight. This is your host Nino and in this episode I am inviting you to another book review on the art of Lisp programming from 1989. And in case you wonder whether something is up with the video, no, the cover really does look that way. The book is actually quite exceptional in its little artistic eccentricities, also in that it is full of Alice in Wonderland illustrations. But that doesn't need to mean that it is anything harmless. I mean, Resident Evil allegedly has also been inspired by Alice in Wonderland, right? So, we jump ahead into the preface. It already begins funnily. Yeah, here it already starts with Lewis Carroll quotes. So, straight ahead you're told that this is the language used by the artificial intelligentsia. And on it goes that it will not be showing you the entirety of Lisp, but more something like an overview. However, it does quite practically immediately plunge you into lists. You're already on page three with a familiar box notation, as well as functions already on page five. So if anything can be said about the book by way of criticism, it would be that it hurries a little bit too much perchance and that you skip ahead perhaps at a too great speed but not sufficient depth to understand the concepts you're actually facing. Then at the same speed in at around page 19 I believe you are already introduced you see further Alice Adventures in Wonderland illustrations, you're plunged into using predicates. That is the if statement, but also whether something is a zero and whether it is like a number or an atom and so on. So you, you, you get to that rather quickly as well as to the boolean functions. I mean, here a couple of more examples might have been helpful. They do follow sort of on the further pages here. And then, just as everything seems to be happiness and chit-chats, you're plunged into recursion, which is introduced way before iteration, like iteration is introduced only some 40 pages later. And the examples are actually quite good. Here for instance on page 24 you're shown how to write a power function. Right, so you have here the base case and then you like a joke like then what? And then you get the idea of how to do the recursive jump, which once I heard a professor describe as a jump of faith. For the one who writes the recursive function must really believe that this sort of expansion down there will bring him closer to the solution. The chapter is quite good. And also the final examples, for instance here with the length of a list, are quite easily understood by the novice. The one thing that I find truly weird throughout this book is the style of parentheses. Like for all I have ever read style guides concerning Lisp, it has always been the consensus that this is exactly not how parentheses are to be aligned. This is basically C style. Whereas Lisp style would be to put them in the end. But I could imagine that the authors preferred that way 
in order to make it clearer and easier for the novice to match parentheses in print, which also would explain why they're a bit set off from the actual functional definitions and why this isn't actually done everywhere. Because then what is perhaps a little unique is that the book has an own chapter on sets and lists, which is not something I'm commonly seeing. Like usually it is some way incorporated and then of course they talk about the usual list functions like, like union and subsets and, and whatnot. Then follow chapters on input and output, whereby input is simple, as shown as read, but output, unfortunately, once again starts with, with this abomination format, which I understand is the new way of doing things in Lisp, and that's why many books start with it but if we're quite entirely frank a simple print would have been perhaps more helpful he does mention print too though in particular over here together with like some other output functions as he calls it now what's sort of funny is how he mentions eval as a function somewhere hidden in a little outline about the uh, read aval print loop as a function also available to the user but if we are sincere maybe that's not a bad idea because using eval in a sort of self-modifying fashion perhaps isn't the best idea to begin with right Anyway, only then, on page 63, do we get to iteration. What is, however, nice about this chapter is that it starts simply with a loop construct, with simply with loop and return, and only afterwards is do being introduced. So that, I believe, is proper for a novice, because actually loop is the way simpler like iteration construct and in my opinion at least the most practical one of them the iteration chapter is generally speaking though quite short and non-exhaustive uh, he also mentions do times and do list but as you can see Things are being mentioned very briefly. I say like, good luck with your getting used to them. And what is somewhat strange is that in the chapter on iterative constructs, mapping is included. In reality, mapping I see more as a operation on functions thing. Like I see it more as a deeply functional topic rather than as a topic belonging into iteration. It is nice though that he starts the chapter with map car, which of the mapping functions is indeed perhaps the practically most important one, uh, which you find also in all sorts of other programming languages. And when I, when I look into it, it's also all they, they treat. So there's no map list for you here, it's just map car. And no and conk and no whatever else, right? So that's what I mean with a, a snappy quick treatment, but perhaps not a very in-depth one. So perhaps you won't really learn Lisp thoroughly from this book, but you'll rather just get a good feeling for it. Anyway, now here comes a chapter on more about program control where they also talk about if 
and let and when and unless and f let and so here you do get a brief overview of all of those conditions and conditionals which you can be using like when and unless and case and so on but what in my eyes truly stands out is the treatment of yeah, on the one hand let of course right but also functional let I really did enjoy that I haven't seen that quite so nicely outlined in other works in fact here you see my own notes when I was experimenting that if you let two variables be like a is 4 and b5 you can then just add them but you can also turn these variables into functions which just simply it's like the function returning 4 and the function returning 5 in all cases and then you can sum the functions with f let like these two are equivalent so that was actually quite instructional and I like that place in particular in this book then on page 83 comes file handling and here what I did like were the well chosen examples of how to handle things here you're having outputting information into a file and then on 87 symmetrically getting information from a file so that I did like a lot that was simple and straightforward though I admit my own approach as I mentioned elsewhere too is to just normally dump everything into a list and to read everything back as one list and then just worry later on how to subdivide that list into the corresponding parts and how to compose out of parts the list to be dumped but basically I don't like intermixing the data logic with the file saving logic and file reading logic and the next chapter is unfortunately rather chaotic it handles association lists and unfortunately um, that's not a very transparent chapter for the novice nor does it give very actual advice for instance here it talks about possibilities of how to update the um, a list through acons by tacking onto its front another pair whereby actually the old pair remains in memory whereas the composition with set which is like set place value which is a standard advice nowadays and not just concerning this particular thing but just it's used in a lot of places and that you could be updating the association list also with set is disadvised and I find that wrong because that's clearly the better solution and they also say oh my god but it is also overwriting the previous um, pair yeah well you know that's sort of the aim isn't it it's not a loss of information as they call it but it's the correct way to handle that if you even want to go for a lists instead of you know hash tables which are not mentioned here and then on page 100 to 102 we're getting also a brief handling of stacks which in turn I find not bad like showing your stack operations and how this pushing is working and the popping so this again I find a nice outline and comes a bit of a sort of chaotic chapter a little bit on 
arrays and strings, which are only somewhat related, Frank. But this page with how RF is working and how to set on RF in order to set array elements, this page I find a very nice brief outline. And here, because you can treat strings as arrays, they have tacked it into this chapter, though. I don't actually see strings as a sort of prime attachment to arrays. They are more of something own. And even shown by this string comparison operation. And if that was a bit of a strange grouping, the next chapter a potpourri of features is actually true chaos. You are, for instance, told about the existence of macros, but in this brevity. Like, wow! That's got to be the shortest treatment of macros ever. And here's the question. Why keep it so brief? Like, why mention it if you don't truly help the reader understand it? Like you see here, this is the end of the macro chapter. Why not omit it entirely, just like you omitted hash tables? And then comes a little comparison between apply and fun call, which in turn, however, is not so bad, because this is really a nice putting together and contrasting these very similar functions, so that the reader gets an idea of when to use what, and like that the difference between them is, is a nuance, but perhaps an important one. In practice, personally, I have always found apply to be the more useful function of the two because that more corresponds to what you are getting. You're having a function and a list of stuff to apply it to and maybe you don't even know how long that list is. Whereas in fun call you need to know how long that list is and, and like which element is exactly where. And that turns out in practice to be well, more complex. Unless, of course, you need fun call in some, let's say, more special setup. And then comes a concise, but actually not bad at all, treatment of arguments. In particular, rest arguments. Somewhat strange to start with the rest, but okay. And optional arguments. I find that actually good outline, and good general outline. Though, in such a case, I would say it would have been more helpful to have multiple optional arguments so that the a reader sees that you can have this multiple times, that you can have like several such bracketed expressions. And keyword arguments. So, in this regard, the quick treatment of things is quite successful. And the reader gets a non-intimidating introduction into what one may call common lisps argument weirdness. So to say you get into arguments without getting into arguments. And what then follows is actually a super funny chapter on debugging techniques. Yes, Alice in Wonderland, of course. The caterpillar. A <laughs> bug, yeah. Well, and the funny thing is that it starts with using format, which one has to say must be like, like printing stuff, must be like the longest surviving technique of debugging ever. Like, for what I have been reading, it seems to have been in good use since the 1940s. And here you have it again. And only somewhat later, IU 
introduced to Therese. And again, the treatment is extremely superficial, but perhaps just enough to get you going. What is important and not mentioned here, though, is that Trace works really usefully only on recursive functions. And that for iteration, well, your best friend remains print in reality. And what then follows is an extremely short chapter on object-oriented programming, again, quite a superficial treatment, though it does tell you here the perhaps important tenets of object-oriented programming, such as information hiding, data abstraction, inheritance, and so on and so forth. And then the last two chapters of the book actually con concern creating a sort of domain-specific language, and I don't think they are all that interested thing to present them here, but it's a bit of a last big homework, as in the tradition of many other list books. And that's it. That's about the art of Lisp programming. So, what this is, is another partial book as one might call it, one where you will not learn the complete common lisp span of possibilities, but certainly one to get you a little bit acquainted and a little bit going in a beginning fashion. So, in my opinion, you will be able to write certain shorter, or simpler at least, programs, but it would be difficult for you, just from having this, to read other people's code. What I should also mention, though, is that on page 162, you are having, actually, a nice listing of the most important functions and predicates which you might use in programming. So, this perhaps is again useful for, for the beginner, or even if you need a little bit of a refreshment in using Lisp. But again, it's just a fraction of what is possible. So, one can say, as a form of introduction, yes, but as an exhaustive teaching material, rather no. Like, that's just too brief for that. Nonetheless, <laughs> it is, in my opinion, quite an enjoyable book, a little bit something different, and I can only concur, is that all? As Alice timidly asked, that's all, said Humpty Dumpty. Goodbye. And that is exactly what I'll be wishing you. Have a wonderful evening. I hope you will join again this channel as regular viewers. Have a great time till then. And from me, goodbye.